we are the community here in Barcelona, ETN Cat. Uh, this is uh, the information for the global project, the Things Network, the Things Network.org, and that's me. I'm, uh, so, yeah, well, thank you again <laughs> to the Barcelona Free Software for uh, inviting us to this presentation, for us proposing it. Um, and uh, before introducing what is the Things Network Catalonia, the community, uh, he works for myself. I work uh, as a freelancer in, in IoT. I should stop doing it. As a freelancer in IoT, uh, I've been working all my life as a software engineer, although I'm an astrophysicist, as information, so nothing to be with it. Much cooler, the astrophysicist thing, but there's no work on that. Um, I've worked in the payments uh, world, I've worked in the e-commerce world, I've worked in the sex world, I've worked in, in different places and uh, since four years ago I started my being freelancer and working on things I like and uh, collaborating, contributing to projects I do like, like the Things Network uh, community. So what is the Things Network? What is the Things Network of CAT? Um, Sorry for the slides, I don't have any. Basically, we are a group of people and entities which are uh, somewhat interested in technological sovereignty. Talking about networks, about uh, Internet of Things, about sensors, about telemetry. Uh, technological sovereignty and social autonomy. Um, that's why we jumped in a project called the Things Network, which was born in Poland. Netherlands uh, four years ago and from the beginning we already were a different kind of entities and people from university to administration to maker spaces industry uh, IOT companies freelancers uh, schools and the community that was built around it is mostly very diverse very heterogeneous but we are a community, so we are a group of people, um, not more than that. Um, when we uh, are deploying, where we are uh, getting subsidies from the from City Hall, like we did last last year, we have like three entities, like umbrella entities, which are uh, what they put, they put the name to say something. Uh, these are the Free Knowledge Institute, the Fundació Gifinet, and Centro Comuns, which is a cooperative. Uh, speaking about the Things Network project, the overall project, it was born in Amsterdam in 2015 when a group of companies, 10 companies, decided to use uh, an already uh, known, well known technology called LoRa to build a network using a relatively new protocol called LoRaWAN. And this kind of technology was very interesting because it's, uh, that it has no network blocking, which means you can deploy your own network. You don't have to rely on a supplier, on a, on a telco. Right? So they, they tried to do it by themselves. They bought 10 gateways and they placed it in, on top of their buildings in Amsterdam city. And they reached a 95% coverage upon the city with just that 10 networks. And gateways. So they thought, okay, that's very powerful. We can empower people, we can build community uh, based networks with this technology, but there are some things to work on before doing that. So they started working on three aspects. First, the hardware. The hardware at that time, the gateways, were about $1,500. So pretty expensive. Pretty expensive if you want to build a community based network. So, we buy the gateways. If it's a company, of course, 1000 1, something might not be a problem, but for people it is. So, they did a Kickstarter where they uh, were promoting this, this gateway, which I have here. And the gateway price in the Kickstarter was 250 and now it's sold for, sold for $300, 300 euros. So, it's, it's great. Um, to be fair, it took them a lot of time to build the, the device 
And in the meantime, a lot of other companies realized that, it, that this, had a lot, this has a lot of potential. So they started doing gateways, cheaper gateways too. Cheaper gateways, and not only gateways, but concentrators, which has a, is the a radio part of the gateway. Let me show you this one. This part of here, okay? Which with different form factors, you can plug on your solution, on your PC, on your Raspberry Pi, whatever, and you can do your own gate, uh, gateway. So nowadays it's possible to have something like this, the concentrator is this chip here, this module here, and you have a, a Raspberry Pi. And this is like 110 euros doing it. Do it yourself, of course, you now need something to put it on outdoors and this stuff, but it's a lot cheaper than, than four years ago. So that was the first uh, thing they tried to do. The second is they needed a backend software to route the messages from the gateway to the user application, the end user application. And they developed uh, a backend, which is open source, you can download it from their GitHub uh, account. And, and it's uh, something you can use for free to manage your gateways, to manage your end devices. And you can, of course, install it in your, in your server, wherever you want. Right now, uh, there are like six major installations uh, managed by them, by the Things Network Poland, to say. And just one uh, installation by a community in Zurich. We plan to do it, but it was not our priority at the moment. So we, we are relying on, on, on Holland, <coughs> on the backend which is in the Netherlands. And the third thing that they do is create a community. Of course they have mm -hmm. like the usual tools for a community, like forums and, and this kind of stuff. But the important thing they do is they, they build the tools to create local communities. And that's what happened. Uh, actually, in the, uh, currently there are like 600 communities, the Things Network communities, all around the world, and about 45,000 people involved in the project in different ways, from doing software to creating the hardware to documenting to whatever, okay? Installing a deploying network. Uh, and that's one of the powerful uh, aspects of the project because that's what they were trying to, to do, to create local communities, to build a network bottom-up. Um, here in, in Barcelona, in Catalonia, we have the, the luck that there is another very successful network, community-based network project called GIFINET. Uh, GIFINET was a project that was born like 16 years ago to uh, make, to, to allow people in far away areas in Catalonia to have Wi-Fi access via ADSL because the companies the telcos didn't want to go that far because it was not profit uh, from an from economic point of view. So they start building a community network where they share this connection. And uh, nowadays there are like 25,000 uh, nodes in Catalonia of GIFINET. Uh, some, of just, some are just like re uh, receiving data but others are network. Uh, notes and we are since we are collaborating with the Fundación Bifinet, which is was one of the entities I, I introduced you before. Uh, we are installing our gateways, the Things Network gateways, by just connected to the nodes of Bifinet. That's why we need the, the the internet access, so they give they give us the internet access. That's very powerful because uh, Bifinet is a philosophically speaking, is a project very much like the Things Network. And they have a lot of experience in deploying network. So that's a, a, a big plus for us. So um, last year, uh, the, 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 the Things Network community in, in, in Barcelona was born like two years and a half ago. And last year we got a subsidy from the uh, city in the Impulsem uh, program, which is meant for a, uh, digital social innovation. So uh, a group of people in the community, and we commit to take this project into real, to realize it. These are people that uh, was the core team of the community in Barcelona. And but of course it's a community, so everyone is invited to to participate to come into the meetings. 
there are different ways to be part of the community, like, of course, uh, creating infrastructure, like buying a, a gateway, one of these, do it yourself, wherever, one of the one that it still costs 1,500, whatever, what you like. Um, we can give you uh, the support of helping you install it, configure it, whatever. Uh, we need professionals in the IoT world, professionals that might help us to configure the network here when we want to, when we will want to, to add the server here, or uh, to do the workshops, because we do a lot of workshops. And of course, everyone is invited to come to the meeting, and we share <coughs> twice a month, the first Wednesday uh, or at noon, to have dinner together, and to have lunch together, sorry, and the third Thursday at, at noon. Uh, let me talk to you a little bit about IoT, which some of you are interested. I don't know if anyone is very uh, on the IoT world. IoT is basically objects connected to the internet. That's what the Wikipedia says. Wikipedia says, says. Uh, but we wanted to add some some uh, value layer on top of that, which is this word. That has to be a purpose to to connect things. That's why we started contacting with uh, social entities in the city, because I th we thought that that they, they were the first ones which might uh, benefit from this kind of network. Uh, how do we connect things to the internet? Of course, we need a transmitter, we need a receiver, somewhere. <laughs> we need information, and we need processing. Uh, the purpose, of course, what are we sending? It's not about big data, it's about meaningful data. And you will know more about this, it's about meaningful data only. And we need a network, a network. Uh, and that's the role of the things network, a network. Uh, there is a manifest in the, the Things Network uh, GitHub which says something like this um, basically um, we foresee that everything that is connected will, that, it, that has power will be connected to the internet <coughs> might be connected to the internet sometime in the future so the, the people who control the network will control a lot of things and we already see that nowadays with the internet um, we, we think that this control, this capacity of having the network and control how this information travels to the network should not be restricted, restricted to, a peop, to some people, to some countries, to some companies. Instead, it should be distributed. So, we actually control the network. We as a, as a people, or we as a community, we as people control uh, the network. And nobody will be able to take it away from us. Right? You can find the manifest here. Um, the key points of the network is that it's very much like uh, the manifest from, from Giffinet, which means the open, free, and neutral network by Giffinet. And it's uh, these this three elements. It's open, it's free, and it's neutral. Uh, I think you already, if you are in this meetup, I think you already know most of it, but let me focus on the neutrality because it's really important. That's what we were talking about before when saying nobody should control the network. Neutrality means that uh, the network is independent from, from the countries. Wherever it's transmitted, nothing has a higher priority than any other thing. So my my, the reading from my fridge, the reading of power from my fridge, is as important as a uh, 5 million uh, invoice from Telefonica. Okay? And it's also neutral uh, regarding the technology. Of course, we are using a certain radio technology at the moment, which is called LoRa, as I told you. But anything that's before that, or anything that's after that, it's completely open. The protocols, the APIs, they are open. Everyone can, anyone can connect either way. Right. So as I told you, we got a subsidy from the, from the, from the Barcelona city to do a 
project which we call the Xarxa Oberta Internet de las Cosas, the Open Network for the Internet of Things, um, which was focused on three different uh, verticals. First, the deployment. If we are building a network, we need gateways, we need antennas. That was one of the first focus. The other one was pedagogy. So uh, telling people was how to use this network in, in technical workshops and why and how and what is this network use, useful for in social workshops. And then we did a couple of hackathons focused on different um, subjects to create use cases. Okay. This pilot finished on November, so we are out of the pilot, not right now, but we did like three, uh, 30 different workshops. We have six uh, antennas in the city at the moment and four more that will be deployed in the next few weeks, hopefully. So they are, they are inside the pilot, but due to different problems, we we didn't uh, make it on time. And we did a couple of hackathons focused on uh, energy poverty, uh, education, I think about it. energy poverty, education, mobility, and um, uh, citi um, citizen science, like uh, contamination and this kind of stuff. Well, as I told you, we use uh, Giffinet network. That it works like an internet. So our gateways are connected to the Giffinet network, and they give us access to the internet via a, a specific uh, VPN door. And at the moment, we are using the back end of the Things network in Amsterdam. When you when you when you say you're using the back end, you mean like you like mm, figure out who you have to send the packets to, or but, but what does the backend do? Backend just routes the packets. It routes the packets. Yeah. So each each message has like a uh, a device ID and application ID, and the backend is the one responsible to say this message is for you. That's okay. But it's software or hardware? Software. So this is what we have or are going to have in the next weeks. Uh, this is very important for us because. Uh, we wanted to build a network bottom up, and that means using with, with, with the community, with people from the community, but also with entities. Um, we uh, started a program of sponsoring partnership, whatever we call it, padrinas, which means like godfathers, people that support uh, entities that support the network, and there are different kind of entities here. I don't know if you know any of them. Wildcat. Is uh, an IoT company uh, that works in the city lab in Cornelia. They have they, they have they have the Orange solution and they have deployed three of their of their gateways in Cornelia. Well Sensing is an IoT company too. They are in near San Sestacio. Collectic, Collectic is a, it's a, an association that works to empower uh, young youth, youth uh, through technology. Uh, they are in Raval. The Institute de Ciencias del Mar, it's a, a public institution which works, which has like studies the, the literal of the sea, it's from the CERCIC. Eco Surveys, uh, it's, a, it's a social company also working on, on things of uh, energy poverty. The Instituto Escola del Trabajo, which is an, an institution of uh, formación profesional. Uh, Diaz Mundet, which is also a, a school, Socotec, which is a makerspace, private makerspace, La Fundación para Manel, it's a social entity that works with uh, socially uh, problematic people, the Fab Lab Barcelona, which you already know, and Rambla Pin, which is also a school. And this is our, except for, is this. And these two, the others, we already have network deployed, and these ones should be in a few next few weeks. There are still some, so this, these bubbles here, they do not actually mean the real coverage of the network. It's like an approximation. Uh, theoretically, in city, 
uh, the range of uh, an antenna is about two kilometers. That's more or, more or less this this network, this boat. But this one here, we have we have one in in Kosciola, uh, 400 meters height, and we get packages from from the Romans. So it's like okay, uh, it's not realistic, but it's like an approximation to find out that we are missing some things in the rich zone of Barcelona or in in this part of here, right? What is it for? So to connect things. Easy. What things? Um, let me let me show you some some already in use use cases, not here in Barcelona, but other in, in other places in the world. Uh, tracking, asset tracking is one of the most useful uh, applications at the moment. Uh, public uh, transportation, private bicycles, this kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, in Barcelona, it's very. Who of you has been stolen their bike? Mm -hmm. I have. So there are commercial products where you can install a, a tracker in your bike to know what it is. They usually have like a, an accelerometer and a GPS, so they know they, they only transmit when they really have to with their position. Agriculture, as I told you, that in the range in, in city is about two kilometers outside the city. There's like ten kilometers theoretically, like average. This, these are average values because. I live in San Polema, which is like 40 kilometers north. And when I when I come by train or by or by car to the city, this antenna here, which is like in a small building, like 10 meters from 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 the ground, I get a message from it at 30, 34 kilometers from here, going in the in the highway at 120 kilometers per hour. So it's you can reach much farther. <coughs> Actually, the LoRa technology alone, if you test it in, in perfect conditions, like in, in open space, uh, you can get up, up to 600, 700 kilometers. But yeah, uh, city is a very harsh environment for, for networks. For so, the, the example about agriculture, this is a project called Vinduino, where you can have like one gateway uh, in, your, in your main place, in the, in the vineyard, and then control the status of your vineyard all around the, the plantation, the crops. This is another project in Oxford, where they are uh, monitoring the, the height of the water up, upstream, so they can know they, they know when there's going to be a flood or where, or any kind of problem with the with the river. And then we have like different kind of products like presence detectors, like um, contamination in the city. This is for a, uh, this is a dendometer to um, monitor the status of the of the trunk of the trunk the trunk of the tree. Okay. And this is very funny. What what, it, what does it look like? Muscular. Muscular. Yeah. Yeah, in Barcelona there are a group of people that every day goes to check if the mouse killers have been used. Every day. So yeah, there's a product connected with LoRa. You can connect it to the Things Network. It simply tells you if the mouse trap has been used. So you can focus on changing the the, the, the cheese or whatever, <laughs> just in those that have been used. And energy poverty. That's not, that's that's a, a project we are working on here, like monitoring the, the status of the how much they consume, how what's the temperature, humidity in a in a house uh, with problems with economical problems. What do we do in the Things Network Catalonia? Well, we do talks like this one. We meet like I told you. And most of the talks lately are about the pilot we were developing. But we are we we will going to try to make more uh, tinkering stuff, like playing with the uh, with the hardware. We do deployment. These are two of our antennas. This is uh, the Rambla Pin, and this is the one we have in Coixerola. That's our antenna. This one. Right. 
We do technical workshops in different places. We do social workshops about visualization of data, about mobility, about energy. Talks in different big spaces or not that big spaces. Uh, we do. We try to do a lot of documentation because that's what uh, the community needs the most. We have a, a wiki, the Things Network.cat, and we also do like software for to create like proof of concept, small devices, sensors, and also how to. This is Node-RED, You know about Node-RED? How to be able to get the information from the network and store it, persist it, or analyze it, or uh, raise uh, notifications, whatever. And we also do hardware, like the ones I've told you. This is my design. This is another, from, from another member of the community. In practice, um, so there are a lot of different uh, wireless technologies. So what does, why is this special? Why do not use like Wi-Fi or, uh, or just and Bluetooth. Well, there, each one of them has their own um, characteristics. So if we are talking about uh, range against power, so this is less power consumption, and that's higher range, we might classify the different, some of the different options like this. You have like low power devices like Bluetooth, LTE, RANDFC, or Sigfox, or LoRa. Sigfox is a, it's a technology very much like LoRa. The only difference is that Sigfox is network locking, so it's like a normal telco. You have to pay them for the message you, you send through the network. But LoRa allows to create the, like, the things network, uh, open networks, private networks even. And you have LTE, Wi-Fi, narrowband IoT, which have for instance, now when I IoT or LTE, it's not like they have like a, a, a great range, but there are a lot of antennas because they use already deployed infrastructure. So that's a plus for them. Wi-Fi, all these are very expensive in terms of, of power. And these are quite cheap. So you, have, you can have like a device with Bluetooth or Sigfox or LoRa running for years, <coughs> just a simple bunch. Coverage and bandwidth. Okay, this is like uh, there's a, in Spanish there's an expression no puedes tener bueno bonito barato. You can have uh, something good, nice and cheap at the same time. You have to try. You have to choose two of them only. So the problem with with this kind of technologies is that you have uh, very uh, little bandwidth. You can send very little information. They are meant, that's why they are meant for telemetry, for sensors, where you can have like one message every hour. Once this, you can stream data, video, whatever. Um, so we're talking about low power wave area, area networks, LP1. Um, these are some of the <coughs> aspects to consider. The low power wide area is focused on these three first. So you have a great range. You have very little power consumption, but you also have very little bandwidth. There are other aspects to, to take into account, but that's more or less the definition of this kind of networks, LP1, right? Uh, with 5G, you have, a very you have a very good transmission latency, and the penetration, the range, the power consumption, the power consumption is very poor compared to, the, to Sigfox or LoRa but you have a lot of bandwidth. Okay. And SIGB has its own use cases, which is problematic when they start compete with 5G. Okay. Um, this is general for LP1, but Sigfox and LoRa has different use cases. For instance, if you're using the Things Network, your subscription costs might be zero, because it's free to use. So what is LoRa, the radio, the radio we're using? LoRa it's a radio modulation, it's propriety. It's by a company, French company called Semtech. That's the only closed layer in all the stack. The chip, they have the license, 
And uh, at the moment, there are only two manufacturers. So that's problematic, kind of problematic. But yeah, we are, it looks like they will open it more. It's a layer one uh, technology, so it's physical. It uses a technology called spread spectrum, which you might like, you might, want, you might see here. So the message is not transmitted in a single frequency, but it's like sweeping through a band of frequencies. Okay, that's one of the key points here, because by software, they can uh, rebuild the message, even when the message is very weak, like, like minus 20 decibels behind, so much, low, much lower than the noise, the electromagnetic noise. That's why we can reach that far. On top of LoRa, uh, there is a, a Mac protocol called LoRa One, which is like maintained by a LoRa Alliance. It's especially defined, especially uh, oriented to, to IoT, long range, low power, low bandwidth. It works on an ISM uh, band, which means it's free to use. You don't have to have a license to use it. But of course, there are some rules to use that band because if everyone is using the band at full speed and, and all the time, it will get collapsed very pretty soon. So there are what it's called like duty cycles, which means in the in most of the of the bands of the exist uh, uh, 868 means that you can use it no more than 100 of the one one percent of the time. But when using on the Things Network. Uh, the fair play rule is that you can transmit for no more than 30 seconds a day. You will know more about this. It's encrypted with two keys, and at the moment it uses a star topology. Although the LoRaWAN specification 1.2 might uh, allow mesh networks, which is like you can have uh, one gateway to, to another to, to another to, to another before going out to the internet. So this is uh, what it looks like, a star topology. You have nodes, you have gateways. Those gateways report to the backend. That's what we have in Amsterdam at the moment. And from the backend, you can have your, your information in your end application. Okay. Of course, more than, get, than one gateway might receive the message from a single node because it's broadcasted. But then the backend is responsible to the duplicator. Um, each gateway might uh, serve to up to one uh, ten thousand nodes, which is pretty good, and that only depends on how far they are from the gate. It's like this. Um, it's more. It's 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 common sense. If you are very far away from something, you have to scream. You have to waste a lot of power to make yourself understood. Okay, that that makes your your battery will go will run out uh, faster. But also. Another way to, to reach farther is to speak slowly. You speak very fast, your message get lo gets lost more easily because it gets like long. Okay, So you try to speak slowly. The problem is that if you speak slowly, since you only have 30 seconds a day, you can send less messages a day. Okay? But it also means that if the gateway has to answer you, the gateway will spend more time answering you. So that will impact the number of notes it is able to manage. Fortunately, there's a technology that allows the node and the gateway to negotiate the speed and the power of the transmission. So if you have a very dense network of gateways, in average, your nodes will be closer to the gateway, and that will mean that the nodes will have to spend less power transmitting the message, they will be able to speak faster, so they will be able to send more messages a day, and there will be less electromagnetic contamination overall. So that's good. <laughs> well, that's that's what it looks like the back end of the of the things network. So you have the node here. You have the gateway. This is the radio part, and from here on it's internet. The gateway uh, reports to a router which at the end, via different handles like MQTT, reach to your final application or different integrations available. So how does it look like uh, from, from, from the perspective of one 
creating a, a, a device. You have four elements. You have the device, the sensor, you have the gateway, the backend, and your ad application. This is the lower part, the radio part. So you have like the communication is encrypted, more or less two to ten kilometers, depending on the environment. Thirty seconds a day of time on air, time on air, and each message, depending on the on how slowly you are speaking, will take from about 15 milliseconds to 3 seconds. That means that you will be able to send between 650 messages upwards to only 10 messages a day. That's very low bandwidth. Okay? Each message about 200 bytes, something like that, maximum. Um, but it's slow power. <laughs> That's cool. So, in the origin, the technology was created to transmit the information from the energy uh, meters of the households. And they have to send one message a day, more or less. That was more than enough because they were charging once per month. So one message a day was more than enough. So the technology is very well suited for that. But of course, you cannot stream a thing through this. So the communication from the gateway to the backend is done encrypted via UDP. And we are using Giffinet network, as I told you. And the communication from the backend to your application is still encrypted. And you can have different handlers. The most uh, useful one, maybe, if you know about it, MGTT. Have you heard about it? It's a message queue in telemetry transport. It's a protocol to send messages, telemetry messages. Um, the encryption is done with two different keys. A network key, which covers from the device to the backend, which is to simply encrypt you know, where the message has to go, and then the application key was goes from the node to the final application. This is the uplink, up means from the node to the cloud, uplink, and the downlink, you can also do downlinks, but it's still uh, more restricted. Basically because most of the nodes we have at the moment are class A nodes, which means they transmit the message, they wait a second in two seconds, like they have two different windows to listen to uh, 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 an answer. And then normally you make them sleep to, 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 stick, to save energy from the batteries. That means that they are not listening all the time. They are only listening after they send a message. So if you send a message, that's the moment when the backend sends the answer, maybe from that, that same message or maybe an answer that was in queue before. So it's not real time. When you send a message from your application to an end node, like open switch, the message gets in queue in the back end. And when the node reports every minute, every two minutes, it might it gets to the back end and the back end says, hey, I have something for you, and it sends it back. Okay. Um, this is a so one of, the, one of the tools that the community uses most is, uh, is uh, a tool called TTN Mapper, which is a web, an application, a, a mobile app and a web where you can actually map if you have coverage in a certain point of the map. It works either because you have a node with a GPS that sends the coordinates of the GPS. If the message is received, it means you have coverage. Or either because you have a node and a mobile phone that is like synced. So if the if, if the if the message gets to the backend and back to the phone, then the phone says, okay, in this same in this same place I'm I'm now, and with the GPS coordinates of my phone, we have top coverage. So we freaky people from the community, we used to go with notes like this one. This is mine and doing coverage. We switch it on, we open the app in the mobile and the phone and we walk through the city or we or while we are traveling or whatever. And we build this kind of maps, the coverage maps. So you, you see this is a, the one we have in, in Colcerola, four hundred meters. It has a very good range in these two directions because it has mountains here and here. <laughs> and you have some more like the world sensing one is very good, the ones from Wildcat. We are doing this kind of maps. And this was just like two days ago. That 
that's my, my personal rep, my personal best mark. Three, four kilometers, three or four, four hundred kilometers from Arenj de Mar to Barcelona. Um, so, I'd like to show you some of the devices. Because I think we are already in time. That's okay. Well, it comes up. Normally, after this, blah blah blah, from uh, we use a, we, that's what the moment we do the workshop. We actually play with the cacharros, tinker with the devices. We are not going to tinker away today, but yeah. Uh, I'd like to show you some of the devices we're using in the, in the workshops. They are mm, prototyping devices meant to create a first version of your solution and then you can uh, create a final one. And, and price-wise, there are very, very different solutions. So these are end devices, okay? So where you attach your sensor to and you send information. This is an Arduino board, you know the project Arduino, right? This is the, Ardu the official Arduino which with a lot of network, a lot of radio. So you can use this from the Arduino IDE and, and program it the same way you would do with any other Arduino. And it's very easy for the people that already know something. And it's about 35 euros. This one is by an English company called uh, Pycom. And it has an ESP32, which is like a system and chip, a very powerful system and chip. It has Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, LoRa, and Sigfox. Okay, and you can you can uh, program it in MicroPython, which makes it very interesting for. It's it's easier than C. I mean, Arduino at the end is C, so MicroPython is easier. This is an, a regular Arduino with a different uh, radio. If you want. Uh, so these are more or less like 34, 35, 40 euros each. And this is the Chinese option, uh, which is an ESP32 also, with a LoRa radio and a, a, a cute um, OLED screen, and it's about 10 euros. So, yeah, you know about Chinese? It works very well. Um, this one. So that means that there are Chinese companies manufacturing the LoRa chip, or there are actually uh, only one of the Chinese. Well, it's the most um, well-known. This one, the ones that makes this chip, it's Hoparef, and they are from China. And they are the only ones that have uh, the license to build the chips outside Suntech. And this is a very interesting one. It's the same as the LoPi, so it's an ESP32 also, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, LoRa, but it's designed here, it's designed in the city lab, in Cornellà. And you can program it in Lua, and in a language, in a block language, like Scratch, very similar to Scratch. Actually, this is the one we use in the workshops when we go into schools, and not only in schools because it's the only one that in a two hours workshop everyone can program themselves the, the, the note. It's very easy with a block, like it's, it's like 10 blocks to uh, configure the network, uh, read the sensor and send the information. And it's very interesting. It's also about 40 years. And And I have this one, this is a tracker. So you have, it's an ESP2, no, it's not an ESP2. You have a LoRa, you have a GPS, and it's meant to, to track things. And those are nodes, and these are gateways. These are just the same as the one uh, I showed you before. The Things Network Gateway, which is meant only for indoor. This one is the one I showed you before too, with a RAC module and a Raspberry Pi. You can build for a little more than 100 euros. And this one is another one which you can add the same uh, radio module here, and it has an ESP32. So you don't even need the Raspberry Pi. It's even cheaper. Only only Wi-Fi with this with this model with this model. 
you don't need the Raspberry Pi, but I mean, it has a processor, right? Or, like, the ESP32 has enough power to do all the, all the heavy lifting. Actually, the gateway, the only thing that the gateway has to do is to bridge between two technologies, from LoRa to UDP. It's very, very um, easy. Um, there is a software called Package for Warder, which does just like that. It forwards packages from one network to the other. And that's the only thing that the gateways do. do. So on all of these boards, you would run the same software? No, no, no. Each one would, would run a different software. Each one, you can use different language uh, programming languages. So it, it will depend on your, on your use case. Okay. So you have like the SP32 is a, it's a 32-bit microcontroller, system on chip actually, with memory, with a lot of memory, with uh, Wi-Fi, Who Bluetooth. Has a lot of memory for you? <laughs> <laughs> it's like one megabyte? <laughs> It has four megabytes flash memory to store uh, the, the firmware and whatever data you want, and almost 5K, 500K uh, RAM. That's a lot for a, for a chip, for a microcontroller. That's a lot. I mean, it's like 100 times more than an Arduino core. How many gigabytes in RAM? 500. That's a lot for a microcontroller. I mean, my first computer had that much fun. <laughs> <laughs> sure, that was like 30 years ago. <laughs> but yeah, there's people running Doom on this kind of microcontrollers in this context. It's more or less what, we, what the PCs were like 300, like 300 years ago, 50 years ago, 20 years ago. That's, enough. That, that's, that's more than enough for this. It doesn't need more than that because. Actually, the SP32 is, is, is a two core uh, microcontroller. Which is because one core to manage the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth stack, and, and the other one for the user. And the Lora stack. No. Yeah. So. And the Lora stack. The Lora stack is in the user uh, part. Okay. And that stack is common for all the different. Most of them. Yeah. Some of the modules already have a, a stack built in. I mean, like uh, the the one. Everything is there. Everything's so. yeah. <laughs> there. This one, this is like an Arduino Leonardo, which is a common board by Arduino, but with a radio module by microchip. This radio module has a microcontroller inside which does all the LoRa's LoRa one stack. And you only have to if there's a um, an AT protocol, a, a simple uh, serial protocol to communicate with the with the module, so you didn't have to care about that. So which protocol do you have? It's a serial protocol. Sorry, SPA. Yeah, SPA. 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 No, no, it's not SPA. It's UART. Ah, UART. No, it's it's UART. It's yes, the simplest one. The simplest one. Okay. So yeah, some of them already have the, the LoRa 1 stack built in. Um, so yes, uh, simple code with C. Like you have to have the keys for the application. I mean, I, I'm not going to go through the code. It's just like showing you that's very simple to make something, uh, to take some, put something running. Uh, you have to join the network. There are two ways to join the network, that's the more common one, with the keys. And once you're joined, you can just send a packet. Like begin packet, write, <coughs> byte by byte, and then end the packet. And done. This is how the, the, the Arduino module, the Arduino board works. Because it also has, a, so the stack is in the radio module. Scripting language, you can you can program your code, your user code. Yeah, but, but it's, it's running C, 
and a, and a, and a low interpreter C. So the firmware is it's written in C, but you can uh, create your code in Lua. And, and actually, this one has a, the IDE is online, so you don't have to install anything in your computer. Just connect it to the to the computer, and well, you have to install an agent, and like a, a serial port, the USB port from the board to your browser. And once you're done, yeah, you can you can program it from the browser. <coughs> so and it's very interesting. And you have both options, Lua or Block. And you can see, if you create blocks, you can see the code it creates in Lua. Blocks is C? No, blocks is, is it's like Scratch, you know Scratch? It's like, it's a language where you, you forget about the syntax. And you only have like blocks of mm, things, like um, uh, 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 a loop. You have the four, and you drag and drop it to the screen, and you configure how from to whatever. And then you have a space in, in the middle to throw all the blocks, to drag and drop all the blocks in, in between them. It's very, it's very, I mean, kids from six year old can do it. And they do it. They, they can program in this, in this language. And, uh, yeah. If you want to be part of the community, um, just be part of the community. Come to the next uh, check. Check. You can. You can. Actually, the best way is to check what we when we are meeting in our website, uh, because uh, communication is not our strength point. Yeah. Um, otherwise, Twitter or uh, uh, we have uh, Google groups too. You can get some information. But the website is the main main place to get the info. How can we help? How can you help? Like, yes. Yes, you have mentioned several areas that we can help. So, um, are any of those that you need more need than others, uh, or that yeah. you want to uh, focus more on that? Or do you no, the things that we actually so we we are the, the pilot has has finished, and so we are now uh, uh, playing community again. Say something, but we want to <coughs> build our own future. That sounds great. That means what are we going to do now? So you can help in defining what can we do at the moment. And we have the option to uh, so thanks to the project and thanks to the hype that uh, Laura has get all around the world, more and more people is knowing about IoT. IoT is a buzzword too, so you can have like easily companies. Uh, knocking on your door asking for help and we need technicians but we also need people that is able to create use cases that are really useful for the for the, for the city and at the moment we are a group of eight people as you've seen and we are three technicians only and the others five are uh, communication they are publicists they are they work in cooperatives so it's like a very a mix, a very interesting mix, but yeah, we need help everywhere. But what what you mean by conditions? It means that you need people that uh, helps others to learn about the devices or that that's one of, making workshops is one of the of the things we need. Or you need people, but we that, also need people that develops the uh, stack or something like we that. We would like to have our own our own backend here in Barcelona. And that means okay, we can have the server, it's not hard. So we have an agreement with the uh, DTNet Foundation, so we can have one of their, their servers very cheap. But we need someone who can deploy a web application and go, which is <laughs> and, and configure it and make it run and make it run and, and maintain. But we also need people able to create uh, physical solutions like devices and devices. Getting out of the so after the prototyping phase, being able to create something that can be deployed in the field. And because what we'd like to do is to have a strong community and a group of people, maybe an association, which is able to develop projects and, and make something that works both ways. So the, 
the, these people being able to create projects and help the community exist and teach and help them understand it and, and develop their own pro projects. Yeah, yeah we are, we're trying to do this. Maybe we will be part of the Femme Per Commons uh, cooperative as a um, cooperativist activity group. It's something. So the Femme Per Commons is a third layer cooperative, so you can have like companies inside of it, and we will be one work group inside of it, maybe. That's one of the most interesting uh, options at the moment. But we, are, we try to, so if we are doing something because there are projects that might help uh, the community grow, we need some way to charge, so, so we earn, earn money from that, enough money to live and to help the community exist and deploy more networks. How do you authenticate the devices? Are the devices shipped with a key already? There are two ways. There are two activation uh, methods. One is called ABP, activation by personalization, which means you actually flash the keys in the device. And, and the other one is over the activation, whole time. Which means you have like a device ID, which you have to uh, defined in the web, in the backend, and then there is a negotiation process with the first uh, message. Let us say, I'm, I'm Fulanito, I'm blah blah blah, give me the keys for this session. And the backend provides a network session keys for that device, for that, for that session. The first one is cheaper, I mean it's easier to implement, it's cheaper from the power uh, point of view because it's only one message, it's fire and go, basically. You can wake up, send a message, and if you don't need the, the answer, you can go to sleep again. The second one involves a negotiation, which is like more messages going up and down, and it's more expensive from the power. Kind of a related question, how do you know how much time over the air the message has been? Because they can tweak you, you can calculate it. You can calculate it, or you can go to the... But how do you calculate it? So there are different aspects of the message that you, can, you, you have to have into account to get an uh, estimation, a very good estimation of how much time on air you have. But the easiest way is you go to the, to the backend, not to the backend, to the gateway that has received the message, and the gateway tells you. So this message has been like 400 milliseconds on air. That's something magic. I mean, it, no, no, because one of, it's actually an interesting problem, right? Like with NTP servers, you cannot synchronize to computers, clocks, that's impossible. You can do an approximation, mm -hmm. but if it's hard to do, if you have a one gigabit fiber optic connection between two computers, it seems that if you, do, if you use radio and low bandwidth... Well, it radio, depends on the position you want. Okay. I mean, if you want to sync these computers up down to the microsecond, then you will have a problem. If you want to sync them down to the second, then it's easy, right? Does it have a timestamp? Because if it's fire and go, I, I, can, I can wake up and say, hey, my message is from 10 milliseconds in the future. That way, I'm... That's, that's uh, in the user uh, realm. I mean, that's something you have to add to your message if you want that kind of functionality. It's not timestamped. How do you measure it then? Oh, so it's, it's, it's deterministic. So you only need to know how much time your transmitter is actually transmitting. Okay? Because that's the time on it. That's the time on it. And how much time the transmitter is transmitting depends on a series of values of the transmission itself. So you can calculate. You so yeah, maybe if you if you are trying to reach the moon, you will have to add some seconds. <coughs> because the moon is far away from here. But for short distances like <laughs> kilometers. It's either you receive it or not, but the time will be more or less that. Uh, the devices still seem expensive. I mean, sure, it's only 10 euros. They, these, are, these are prototyping devices. Okay. They are always expensive. I mean, if you want to build your own, if you want this, this radio, which is a LoRa radio, you can have them in, I think, 100 batches for less than three years. 
So you can start building something for be behind ten years uh, for less than ten years with a microcontroller with whatever. Actually, the radio itself is more expensive than the the ESP32 chip, which is kind of weird. So yeah, yeah, but this 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 kind of devices are always expensive because they are half. Just because when you have a production device, you maybe do a batch of thousands and thousands. These people in the city lab, they do batches of tens. So, yeah. And then you have different options which might not be necessary for your end device, like the battery holder. Right, so, if I end up doing something, it might be like one euro or two euro, five euro products. Yeah, in the future, yes. Lorna is a little more expensive than Sigfox, but Sigfox has a use case, very interesting use case. Uh, they did with FedEx. And they did uh, just like the WhatsApp uh, notification of your messages in red, but uh, uh, an, an envelope notification as your, your envelope has been opened using Sigfox. And they managed to build a transmitter that was able to transmit up to 10 messages because it has like a 20 milliamp power battery uh, for less than less than 20 cents. But that's Sigfox, and Sigfox has a very powerful economic uh, push from the French government. <laughs> so it's not comparable. It's not comparable. So, mm -hmm. so do you do you want to build the whole device? I mean, it's because here you have, as I see, many of those boards. Yeah, it consists of two different boards. So one is the, the processing board and the other one is the radio board. It will depend on the time you have and, uh, and the money you have. But the idea is that you have a single device with the uh, computer there? Yeah. That's, uh, that's the point. Ideally, ideally, I mean, we might have a project in the future to build devices for, uh, uh, for, for the city of Santa Coloma, mm -hmm. uh, working on things of, of our uh, energy poverty. Mm -hmm. And if we want to build like 1,000 of those devices, we, we have to make them the cheapest. That means everything will be in the same PCB, everything will be integrated. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, a simple microcontroller with radio module and the sensors needed to measure that. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no stacks, no prototyping boards. It has to be cheaper than a prototyping board with all the features it will have. Well, here's an idea. Let's slowly get going to the kitchen and ask him tons of <laughs> questions over there nice. around beer. Thank you very much.